uh, we're, we're starting the school now. Uh, welcome to everyone from the Institute of Social Sciences and Humanities Scotia. My name is Sami Mekonayoto. Um, uh, right now, um, uh, we're going to come up with uh, several notes uh, and technical, uh, technical details. Um, first of all, the start of the summer school is with the lectures uh, here. Uh, Anna Blazovod was also a project coordinator for the project with uh, Rosalind Sikushitman and myself. Um, um, we also want to thank uh, explicitly Rosalind Sikushitman for supporting this event. For yet another year, Xenia from Rosalind Sikushitman is also with us here. Um, another technical detail is that on a daily basis, there's going to be a list you have to sign. Uh, we're going to pass it on every day. Um, um, and um, most importantly, uh, some of the participants haven't arrived yet. They will be arriving throughout the day, and by the end, we hope that by the end of the day they will, will be the proper group as it should be. Um, and finally, and most importantly, uh, as you probably already know, there are some changes in the program. Unforeseen circumstances, one of the lectures didn't arrive. Uh, um, and um, okay, so Sandra Mofeva is going to participate in the school, but she's not going to be physically here, unfortunately. She had a, also a major um, serious reason not to come, but she will deliver the lecture tomorrow via Skype and will be able to, to I hope, uh, have a proper um, session with her. Um, and you have the change program, the detailed program, yet again sent to you last night, so you should have it. And we've printed some copies that are we for purposely left on the tables for, for everyone to see. Um, so now I will give the floor to Apple to say a couple of words and then we start. So, uh, welcome to everyone from me as well, because I'm in a double capacity here as the director of the institute and also as uh, one of the speakers. I'm very pleased to have you all here as guests. As, yeah, I see you as our guests, first of all, and second, as participants. Uh, it is really a strong group of um, you know, presenters, obviously, and uh, the entire program of uh, abstracts or the portfolio of abstract uh, abstracts uh, looks uh, pretty exciting. So um, I don't see here the, any hierarchy be between keynote speakers and the other presenters because we are facing an equally strong um, group, uh, equally strong groups in the panels as well. So uh, that's how I see the structure uh, of the event. Uh, yes, we are sad that uh, Oksana could not come. Unfortunately, uh, some uh, tragic uh, accident occurred, so she really could not make it. Uh, and uh, as for Hagon, we have no idea, but uh, as I heard last night, most of you have similar experiences, so you're not su that surprised. Um, other than that, um, the program will go as uh, announced in the latest email with the updated uh, program. And me as well, I want to thank the, the organizing uh, team and the uh, uh, Rosa Luxemburg uh, Foundation for Southeast Europe for supporting us for a third year now, practically fourth, uh, fourth. We, we are in the fourth year now. Um, this uh, kind of events and also the proceedings that will come out of the event as well as other uh, activities. Uh, but I'm uh, referring to the proceedings uh, in order to explain the structure of my paper. Uh, it's basically a concept, a draft, the full and final version will appear in the proceedings in identities. 
Um, we hope to be able to publish some of your papers there as well. Um, Stanimir will, toward the end of the school, will uh, talk to you more uh, on this. And uh, now I will start with uh, uh, the presentation. Let's call it that way. Uh, first, we'll, hmm? sir. Oh, he has to present me. Okay. <laughs> well, a couple of words for Katerina Kolozova. Um, this is the protocol. Uh, who's, um, as you probably most know, but some of you don't, she is uh, the program director and senior researcher at the Institute of Social Science and Humanities. She's a distinguished feminist um, um, and uh, Marxist scholar, author of books such as like Cut of the Real, Marx and Lorwell, um, um, and uh, 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 The Greeks and Death, which was her first book. Um, she's been around for uh, many years now, and I'm pretty sure you know her work already. Um, so welcome to Katerina Karolicza. Thank you. So, um, we, will uh, we will start with commenting several um, quotes uh, I took from uh, Marx uh, and from Irigaren in order to establish the analogy in the argument and uh, to shed light on uh, the reversal of, uh, so the feminist reversal of Marxist uh, or Marxist etymol uh, epistemology uh, Irigare undertakes. Um, I have chosen some quotes. Uh, I usually make these comparisons and analysis through uh, um, Irigare's um, work, uh, uh, through other works by Irigare, mostly uh, speculum. But uh, thanks to Johanna, is she here, Johanna yeah. Heschel, uh, who was um, a researcher at the Institute last year, last winter, uh, who reminded me of some so evident quotes in Irigare, uh, we can make use of in a similar um, analysis we were both uh, undertaking. Um, I sort of... Uh, uh, turned my attention uh, toward uh, this quote. Uh, perhaps the thickness of the argument in Irigare uh, and its expounding does uh, the, the exist primarily in uh, in the speculum, but here the uh, sort of transparent uh, um, analogy between uh, and structural simil similarity between the two arguments, but in the case of Irigare, a complete reversal uh, uh, of perspective, but structurally still the same argument uh, is. Uh, so visible in this book and especially in this uh, passages um, Johanna reminded me of. So, uh, so let me sort of walk you through uh, the idea, through what I will be presenting. Um, it might um, sound uh, unorthodox from a Marxist uh, point uh, of view. Uh, because the talk will be uh, primarily on the question of subjectivity and on the problematic constitution of the category of subjectivity we find in post-structuralism and uh, a configuration which makes it hardly uh, reconcilable or um, welcoming uh, uh, to an integration with uh, Marx's method. So, indeed, there in post structuralism, we we'll probably deal with uh, post Marxism and post Marxism, um, which is already detached even from the position of post. Um, it, uh, uh, the, the two. Uh, what is missing there is uh, an epistemic uh, possibility of uh, realist uh, 
discourse or method, I would say method, but maybe discourse is also relevant, at least for those of us who still speak uh, in post-structuralist uh, language, because there is a certain inhibition of language as well uh, uh, inside the post-structuralist argument, uh, which prohibits this methodological epistemic uh, possibility. So, in order to uh, uh, link uh, and amalgamate these possibilities of uh, Marxism, a feminist legacy of considerations of uh, the, the issue or the question of the subject, and hence the consequences for um, identity, uh, not just politics, considerations of uh, identity, theoretical ones as well. Uh, and in order to be able to put forward a materialist proposal, counter-proposal, uh, that would tackle uh, and address the issues uh, that identity politics usually deals with, but that would tackle them in a materialist way, in a structural uh, way, in a systemic way, rather than from the perspective of uh, the subject, rather than in terms of identity, uh, simply to point out to the possibility that the Marxist uh, sort of treatment of these issues that are relevant would not be necessarily or would not come down necessarily to identity uh, politics uh, and these theoretical possibilities. In order to arrive to this uh, political possibility, we have to go through this uh, theoretical consideration. So this is like a, sort of a sketch of how the, the argument will um, evolve. It's not, of course, uh, clear from the beginning what I'm talking about, uh, because this is the, just the preamble of uh, uh, the lecture. Uh, to sum up the preamble, we will propose a different consideration of the, uh, the question of the subject that would be in line with uh, uh, the feminist uh, legacy, uh, but uh, which would primarily rely on a certain form, form of uh, realism. Uh, I use realism similarly to materialism, uh, simply because um, Marx uh, uh, uses realism in the way we use uh, materialism, uh, in the context of uh, Marx's discourse, uh, of course. And also, uh, this is the position of uh, uh, non-philosophy and non-Marxism, which is a a method of uh, reading and working with uh, Marx. So there uh, lies the reason uh, why I resort to the term um, uh, realism rather than materialism, although I c occasionally use materialism as well uh, by pointing to the fact that it's not uh, philosophical uh, materialism. Uh, so anyway, uh, I will propose a different consideration of the subject, one which will rely on realism, understand the concept of realism in line with uh, Marx and in line with certain uh, non-philosophical uh, reading of uh, Marx. I will propose that um, uh, depending on uh, the analysis, actually if we exit a, th a philosophical analysis and uh, position ourselves on, on a certain plane on, of uh, Marxist or post-philosophical science that uh, both possibilities are permitted to think the subject in uh, terms of singularity and oneness and in uh, terms of multiplicity and transformability. The latter is, as you know, the preferred uh, subject by the post-structuralists, multiplicity, transformability, etc., etc. Um, and particularism uh, goes with that. I will propose that that should not be excluded, but 
by way of allowing it uh, as uh, something taking place on a different plane of uh, analysis, a properly Marxian approach would be to permit a diff, uh, an, another plane of analysis with the, which does not exclude the previous one but unilaterally positions itself toward uh, the previous one, uh, which permits uh, discourse in terms of uh, unity, uh, uh, oneness rather than unity or unilateral unity, and all of that is necessary in order to conceive of a new form of um, um, universalism. So uh, all this tedious work has to be done in order, in order to propose some new possibility of universalist discourse uh, by way of countering um, all the possible um, criticisms of post-structuralism we can uh, sort of anticipate. In fact, uh, in a way, I'm not anticipating them. I, uh, when I was uh, when I started doing this analysis, I, I started doing it as somebody who was coming from the post-structuralist uh, position and uh, decided to face its aporias and. Uh, uh, propose uh, solutions uh, for those. So apart from that, uh, we will also problematize the uh, uh, concept of subject and subjectivity. We will problematize its centrality as it was problematized by Marx himself. Uh, we will consider his counterproposal to look at things objectively, but this objectivity is not the positivist objectivity, as you all might remember. It has nothing to do with uh, positivism and that concept of uh, objectivity, nor with object-oriented uh, ontology, I think, because it looks like, you know, it's merging the... Marx would say they treat this object from a subjective position. So, um, so I will uh, explain that uh, um, idea in Marx and that will lead us to uh, the proposal I, was, uh, I will present here, uh, which is a conceptualization of a self rather than a subject, which um, um, uh, sort of integrates uh, in itself the, the category of matter and the real more that than you know physicality and bodily uh, at least not in the that usual uh, I mean it includes the body and physicality of course this is also Marx's uh, concern as well and it's important but we are, are proposing a further for formalization of this proposal by, by treating this category as the, the real uh, and matter in that non-philosophical sense. So uh, this uh, the hybrid, uh, uh, this, this hybridity of uh, selfhood is uh, indebted primarily to uh, uh, feminist uh, philosophy, to uh, Donna Haraway, uh, to Irigaray, uh, the treatment of Irigaray of the signifying automaton. Uh, and that will be the, the really long intro into what I'm going to talk about. But uh, I, you know, uh, I guess if, you, if you're not familiar with um, all are well with non-philosophy, with certain arguments in the so-called uh, speculative uh, realism, it might sound confusing. So I hope this intro is um, useful somehow. So uh, this will lead us to this uh, composition of self I uh, just mentioned. Uh, uh, the last remark in the intro um, I made, uh, it is a selfhood which 
operates rather than with, uh, as Laurel would call them, philosophically spontaneous categories of the body and technology, uh, to uh, with further formalized uh, and absolutized categories of the automaton and the real. The real is um, a, um, a category uh, that can be embodied by the physical body, by the organic uh, physicality, or by synthetic physicality. I mean, it, it could be technology. So it could be technological. Um, whereas the automaton is literally the automaton of signification, like the like language, for example, like exchange of value in market economy, like exchange of women and patriarchy. So, okay, now I'll stop introducing the, the lecture and just go on and get on with it. So, uh, this is a uh, quote from uh, Lacan, and it sort of introduces the way uh, I will treat the concept of the automaton, that all these uh, revisions of categories are relevant in order to reconceptualize the, the self as I proposed, um, which will be in line with Marxism, but uh, will, uh, which will also radically revise the post-structuralist uh, legacy of feminism. So, uh, he says, the world of the symbolic is the world of the machine. Uh, here, uh, the, the symbolic is equated, as in many places in Lacan, with the automaton. Basically, you know, the signifying chain is the automaton. Psychoanalysis in uh, Lacan, you will find that he operates with the concept of the automaton, and Tihe uh, Tihe is the instance of the real, the automaton is, is the signification. My point here is that it's not much different than the automaton, uh, uh, the way it's understood by De Saussure or the way it's understood by Turing, for example. But we will arrive to that uh, later. First, let's uh, compare the automata of signification, the uh, dominant automata of uh, signification in contemporary uh, capitalism. Um, so we have this uh, quote from uh, Birigere, which makes it sort of obvious uh, that the patriarchal, uh, patriarchal exchange of, of women is not very different than, uh, or rather femininity, not very different uh, from that um, uh, of, you know, uh, money, commodity, money, that's formal. And there is also a quote from uh, Turing. So, th this is the way we will treat the category of the automaton. So, she says, this is from uh, uh, this sex, which is not one. She says, the production of women, signs and commodities is always referred back to men. When a man buys a girl, he pays the father of the, or the brother, not the mother. And they always pass from one when a, a man to another, from one group of men to another. Uh, so the point here is, we will arrive to that, that uh, what is being sold is women as signs uh, women as currency, what is being sold is the fetish of, fem of femininity. And that is why there is uh, this uh, a structural hierarchy in heterosexuality which is practically uh, un uh, insur uh, 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 insurmountable. Uh, you know, it, it requires a complete structural uh, reversal. Uh, and the reversal is uh, the transformation of women from commodity, from fetish, and from surpl surplus value in a way into use value. And transcending the logic of value itself 
and arriving to the relevance of materiality as such. So in a way, she gives uh, perhaps the most concrete proposal after Marx as to how uh, to realize Marx's proposal, how we go about the transcendence of the problem of surplus value, which is a problem of value and the, uh, the relation value has to the mere matter, to the, the inferior matter, to materiality as resource. So um, interestingly, this huge political problem is in fact a metaphysical problem. And we, we in fact cannot go about and solve it without uh, you know, taking some position vis-a-vis -vis certain metaphysical Dilemmas. So, what I was, uh, I will, I'm also proposing, not here, but in the book uh, on Marx, uh, is that um, we come to terms with certain uh, metaphysical questions, and uh, also I sort of propose there to revise Marx's proposal of. Um, uh, n not Marxist, actually Marxist, uh, Marx is fine, his proposal is fine. Uh, the rest of the contemporaries proposal to uh, sort of exit and surpass metaphysics. Marx actually proposes to uh, exit philosophy and okay with philosophy metaphysics as well. And I suggest we keep metaphysics because uh, uh, we cannot do without. Uh, we radicalize it. Uh, it's, I would say, the grain of uh, what takes place in science as well. It's not counter scientific at all, actually. If it's possible to radicalize it in a non philosophical manner through the method proposed by um, Laruel, but it's, um, there is no time to elaborate all of that. This is just a passing remark. But the point is, one has to t come, to come to terms with these issues. So, uh, so uh, this is uh, the quote. There is another quote here from uh, Turing, where you, you can see the comparison of um, a certain type of human labor with computing and the cognitive task of computing according to him uh, is comparable to this to what you see there in fact he does not even call this knowledge or intelligence or whatever he's very specific and very precise in explaining what the computing machine does and he says the following the class of problems capable of solution by the uh, the machine I forget what this stood for but you know the original the generic computer can be defined fairly specifically they are a subset of those problems which can be solved by human clerical labor, working to fix ru fixed rules and without understanding. So as you can see, he differentiates understanding from the task of computing. Uh, and it reoccurs in uh, the two texts from Turing I quote in this uh, paper and now this is uh, uh, these two quotes uh, this one from Marx and uh, the other one uh, and the next one from Mirigere are uh, important to uh, sort of uh, see uh, how structurally similar the automata of um, uh, Patriarchy and capital are, and the formula uh, uh, the formula is sort of the same. Uh, okay, uh, and it's interesting that the, the analogy is also patriarchal toward the end. The analogy that uh, Marx uh, makes here. So, so here's. Uh, 
how uh, it sort of, uh, uh, here is the formula uh, at the position when use value sort of matters uh, more than uh, surplus value. But he anticipates that, you know, this will reverse and, you know, value will simply merge into value and that the formula, formula at the end will not be C, M, C, neither M, C, M, money, commodity, money, but it will result into money, money, uh, if you remember. Uh, he speaks of this acceleration of capital and the circulation of capital in uh, the third volume, yeah, uh, here, but uh, in a different uh, place. And there he analyzes the, the laws of um, auto acceleration of capital. So uh, as far as uh, the accelerationist argument we had last night, uh, yeah, uh, to Marx that, you know, just makes no sense because um, capital accelerates itself to singularity almost. So, um, but that's in a different place. And the logic is basically this one. But we are focusing on something else now, on the similarity with patriarchy. So, he said, in simple circulation, commodity, money, commodity, the value of commodities attained at the most, uh, 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 attained at the most, a form independent of their use values. Uh, the form of money, uh, you know, this abstraction, you know, the worth, we are all aware of, it st stands there as some sort of real itself and it does operate as a certain real itself. This abstraction that has been reified, the worth of value or the value or money. So the form of money, but that, but that same value now in the circulation of, of according to the formula money commodity money. So it's already, uh, 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 it's transformed and it turns out that the circ circulation takes place not, you know, uh, for the purposes of use and, you know, uh, use value is of almost no relevance anymore according to this reversal of the formula. It turns out that the, the entire cir circulation takes place in, in fact uh, so that uh, money engenders money, more money. So surplus value, more surplus value. Uh, use value becomes irrelevant. The two are merged into, you know, just pure value. Uh, money, money. So, uh, but, uh, and this is the procedure of fetishization and all that, you know, about that, I'm guessing. So, but uh, that same value now in circulation money, commodity money, or the circulation of capital suddenly present itself as an independent substance endowed with a motion of its own, passing through a life process of its own. So the money, the pure uh, estimation. You know, when uh, we use the, the word, uh, uh, value, it invokes, you know, philosophical axiology, so it, we sort of enter the realm of ideas, so sort of somehow makes sense to us that, you know, value circulates and, you know, value produces value, but if, as, um, that has taken a life of its own, um, in this more cynical way, which would be the materialist angle of looking at things, it sort of becomes weird and, you know, Marx's critique of uh, fetishism and commodity creation sort of makes sense uh, more clearly uh, than before. So, but that same value now in the circulation, money, commodity, money, or the circulation of capital suddenly presents, presents itself as an independent substance. The estimation now, 
the worth, the, the money, is now an independent substance, endowed with a motion of its own, passing through a life process of its own, in which money and commodities are mere forms which it assumes and casts off in turn. So even money and commodity are just forms that this signification production, the, that this valorization process, the process of valuing, this is what capital comes down to, the exchange uh, in, uh, in market. Uh, it really, toward the end, uh, takes this both money, so, you know, even Bitcoin is no revolution at all. I mean, it's just one of these forms that it can reject. So both commodity and uh, money are mere forms, uh, as he says, that it assumes this value producing itself, uh, that it assumes and casts off in turn. Nay more, instead of simply representing the relations of commodities, so what has use value and physical worth, uh, worth, yeah, okay, never mind, um, the, um, it represents the relations of commodities. It enters now, to, so to say, into private relations with itself. So, the value producing value, or money producing money. But we will take money now as a generic term, so it doesn't ma matter if it's Bitcoin or uh, whatever, virtual or physical money. So, we'll take it as a generic term. So, money, uh, uh, produces itself. Uh, this is why uh, he says it enters now, so to say, into private relations with itself. It differentiates itself as original value from itself as surplus value. So original value, surplus value. As the father differentiates himself from himself qua the son. Yet both are one and of one age. For only by the surplus value of 10 pounds does the 100 pounds originally advanced become capital. And so soon as this takes place, so soon as the son, and by the son the father, is begotten. So the, uh, actually the father begot the son, but strangely, uh, 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 there is temporal reversal. It's big. Uh, he's also begotten by the son, but you don't have women here in the process begetting anything. They are the currency, so that this auto production takes place. So soon does this uh, dif difference vanish, and they again become one. Hundred and ten pounds. So, money, surplus, uh, money, value, money, money. Uh, so, I haven't written this, but I should have. Um, you can, the same equation you saw there. Oh, it's in a different paper I'm writing, and I thought that it was here. So, uh, you can make a perfect par parallel, and instead of money, uh, instead of M, you can put P, phallus, and uh, instead of C, femininity as commodity, so not women, femininity. The way commodity is not the object which is the use value, right, but the abstraction that can be exchanged, in the same way, uh, women as use value or in their reality are not what is being exchanged in patriarchy. It's femininity. It's the fetish. So th that is why the woman takes the place of commodity. It's the fetish. It's a fetish. Um, and then P. So the formula is phallus, femininity, phallus. And this formula comes down to what Irigara says calls homosexuality with two M's uh, where 
you have a sexuality of the uh, whereby the phallus produces itself and enters into uh, into relations with itself so phallus into sexual and reproductive relations with itself via uh, women and actually via femininity because the position of uh, women can be taken the way it's explained structurally can be taken also by gay men and can, can be taken by trans uh, women as well I mean, uh, she does not say this in the book, uh, but it's clear that, you know, structurally the argument allows that. It does not only allow, it invites that. As far as uh, for male homosexuality, she does that, uh, say that explicitly, that they sort of inhabit the same uh, position as uh, the commodities, women as commodities. So that was uh, the quote from Marx, and I sort of anticipated what would be similar in Irigar's uh, argument. And now here it is, uh, the quote. Um, this is the bit Johanna found last uh, winter. So she, uh, she writes, uh, in still other words, all systems of exchange that organize patriarchal societies and all the modalities of productive work that are recognized, valued, this is the key thing, and rewarded in these societies are men's business. The production of women, signs, and commodities is always referred back to men. We saw a shorter version of this quote at the beginning. When a man buys a girl, he pays to, okay, we read this. And uh, they always pass from one man to another, from one, one group of men to, an, uh, to another. The workforce is thus always assumed, uh, this is interesting and it's true, maybe this is why we always inhabit the reproductive realm, not the productive one. Uh, it's sort of some unrecognized territory there of production. So, she says, the workforce is thus always assumed to be masculine and products are objects to be used, object of transaction among men alone. Which means that the possibility of our social life, of our culture, depends upon a homosexual monopoly. Uh, this homosexuality is heterosexuality, male heterosexuality. Uh, the law that orders our society in the exclusive valorization of men's needs and desires, of exchanges among men, what the anthropologist calls the passage from nature to culture, thus amounts to the institution of the reign of homosexuality not in an immediate practice, but in its social mediation. From this point on, patriarchal society might not be interpreted as society functioning, uh, might be, sorry, uh, interpreted as societies functioning in the mode of semblance. And the, the ultimate semblance is the woman, as the image of femininity, as the commodity in this transaction. The value of symbolic and imaginary productions is superimposed upon and even substituted for the value relations and corporal reproduction. In this new matrix of history in which man begets man as his own li likeness, the same, you know, way as in Marx, the 100 pounds being the father, and uh, then begotten by the 110 pounds by the sun. So in this new matrix of history in which man begets man uh, as his own likeness, wives, daughters, and sisters have value only in that they serve as the possibility of and potential benefit in relations among men. The use of and traffic in women subtend and uphold the reign of masculine homosexuality 
even while they maintain that homosexuality is speculations, this is uh, the key thing that uh, links her to, to Marx and the uh, critique of commodity fetishism. You know, the, uh, the fact that this um, speculation, this product of mirroring, this, this image the, the commodity is, or it being a pure form, right, value, it is the general form through which, uh, to which, um, as uh, the general equivalent for value exchange, uh, taking on a reality of its own. So in a very similar way, we can see here the position of women and uh, femininity, especially in sexuality femininity in sexuality. Uh, even while they maintain that homosexuality in speculations, mirror games, identifications, and more or less rivalrous uh, appropriations which defer its real practice. Woman as object of exchange differs from woman as use value. in that one does not know how to take hold of her. For since um, all these male, uh, male philosophers, that they never know what the woman thinks, what the woman wants, what's her desire. Of course they don't know, because this is uh, a spectral woman they're talking about. This is the fetishist form. It, it's the surplus value of femininity they have in mind, not the use value. So, uh, differs from woman as use value, in that one doesn't know how to take hold of her. For since the value of commodities is the very, and this is a paraphrase of Marx. Uh, do you remember this quote from uh, uh, Marx? The value of commodities is the very opposite of the coarse materiality of their substance. This is from Marx. So she's paraphrasing him uh, in the case of women. And she says, woman as an object of exchange differs from woman as use value in that one doesn't know how to take hold of her. For since the value of commodities is the very opposite of the coarse materiality of their substance. Not an atom of, uh, this is still uh, Marx actually, not an atom of matter enters into its composition. So this is valid for women uh, in the context of this analysis, of Irigaris' analysis, and um, the entire quote, actually, the, uh, uh, the end of quote should be after the uh, point, uh, at the end of the phrase, because this is the, the entire phrase is from Marx. The value of commodities is the very opposite of the coarse materiality of their substance not an atom of matter enters into its composition. End of quote from Marx. Um, so if I continue with the analysis of these quotes, there will be no time to read a bit from this uh, paper. Uh, where I, this, I propose this um, uh, reconsideration of subjectivity. So starting from a feminist post-structuralist uh, uh, position, taking this legacy, uh, not rejecting what's worth there for us, but um, sort of treating it non-philosophically in order to provide space for a certain uh, degree of realism which will take us somehow elsewhere beyond the paralysis uh, of post-structuralism we are currently witnessing. So, um, the subjectivity uh, uh, as a linguistic philosophical projection. Uh, between the immaterial uh, self or subjectivity, in quotation marks, uh, immaterial self, self or subjectivity, and the body, 
there is certainly a material, cognitive, and affective continuity. And the philosophical dualism underpinning the two is false because it's one grounded in a non-materialist uh, epistemology. There is a materialist, material and materialist continuity between the two instances as, for example, Lisa Blackman explains in her book Immaterial Bodies, Affect, Embodiment and Mediation. Uh, Lisa will speak this summer at the summer school in Belgrade, right? Uh, and I will too. <laughs> uh, that's important. And Stanley will be there as well. Uh, okay, so uh, there is a materialist continuity between the two instances. Uh, okay, I, I concur with the, the thesis about the physical continuity between the body and cognition. And it is a fundamentally materialist one. And the method based on uh, Karl Marx and Francois Laruelle I employ here is non-philosophically materialist. Uh, so we can use the word materialist instead of realist, although I insist Marx always uses realist. Practically never materialist. Um, Marx himself, so in the original texts. So the term non-philosophy is used here in Laruelian sense to be explained in more detail below in the paper. So, however, for the purposes of an analysis of subjectivity from a non-humanist perspective, so this non-humanist perspective is the non-philosophical Laruelian flexion and also inspired by Haraway uh, flexion of post-humanism. So I use the notion of non-humanism here in that way. So it's uh, radically and profoundly humanist, the argument, but without the philosophical humanism. Okay, so however, for the purposes of an analysis of subjectivity from a non-humanist perspective, I will propose here we will need to absolutize the categories of subjectivity, which I will call here the signifying automaton, and nothing beyond that. And when we talk about uh, the, uh, the participation in, uh, of the material in the composition of the self, I will speak of a different self, I will speak of the non-human self or as Laurel would call it, uh, the human in human or whatever, but not subject or subjectivity. It's a shame I cannot uh, quote this entire history of the concept of subject, which is a short one. Uh, so, uh, and, uh, so I will propose here, we'll need to absolutize the categories of subjectivity or the signifying automaton and the body in their conceptual distinctness, as such categorical abstractions are needed for a greater level of formalization of the discussion that we seek to undertake here. Uh, how much time do I have? Well, we started 15 minutes later, so... Until 11.30 or 40. When is... No, I will finish on time, maybe five minutes late, because we will miss the coffee. Okay. Okay. Well, anyway, just five minutes late. Um, okay, so uh, subjectivity, so here is a s short history of the subject and subjectivity, this category is so central to uh, post-structuralist feminism. So, subject, uh, and here I'm taking a resort to a brief history of the concept uh, Nina Power uh, presented in Parisia, which is one of the rare, rare uh, sort of historiographical accounts of, uh, you know, on the history of, of the, the concept, the genealogy of the concept. So, Subjectivity is the product of the linguistic turn in philosophy. Yes, it, it is preceded by Kant, but it comes down to the same. So, the preceding history of philosophy spoke of the self 
uh, it referred to an eye. And did, uh, and so did, uh, and here I'm referring to this data I draw from Nina. So, and so did the subsequent history of philosophy except for post-structuralism and its derivations such as constructivism, deconstruction, culturalism, and theories of identity. Considering the body has never participated in the structuralist subject, except via, and that is the linguistic term subject par excellence, uh, except via its uh, construction as signification. The formulations, uh, for example, a formulation of the sort like subjectivity without physicality would sound like a tautology. It's always already after the linguistic uh, term without uh, physicality is uh, this automaton not much different from the automata of capital and patriarchy we uh, ex explained, at, explained at the beginning. It's just uh, subjectivized. So yet again, there seems to be an irresistible philosophical spontaneity to presuppose a role for the body in this construction, uh, at least uh, for post-structuralism. Uh, and for post-structuralism, uh, this barred role of the body is the uh, 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 this pre presupposed role uh, of the body is the barred instance constitutive uh, of the subject that is the body in its aspect of the real, which does not enter the composition of the self, so of the subject uh, in post-structuralism. So the post-structuralist subject is made possible by the constitutive absence of the real because the body inhabits the position of the real. In post-structuralism it does, it, it's this territory. Remember Judith Butler, Bodies That Matter, Matter and all of her books? It's the body as such, body beyond signification is the instance of the real. And the instance of the real is something we do not think. And we do not think it because, uh, think it, because it, it's, it ex escapes our full control. Uh, the subject's full control. So, uh, so mat matter, materiality escapes it as well. And matter is de declared irrelevant. Uh, in the context of this theory, for example. So, the post-structuralist subject is made possible by the constitutive absence of the real, here included the body, either in the form of the other, you know, the Lacanian other, or as the physical body. So, these are the usual um, incorporations of the real, the other or the physical body. Uh, in the sub subject uh, except as a symptom. So uh, both forms of absence are compensated by the imaginary recreation of the real via representation that play, uh, representation of the body that plays the role of the other or the body. A representation or signification substitutes the always already absent real. As a result, it creates the autoreferential reality of the subject or the post-structuralist self. The self-mirroring reality or speculation in both Irigaray's uh, sense in, and Marx's sense as the only possible reality. Such is the self that is nowadays called the subject the product of the linguistic turn in Western history of ideas. Speculation does not mediate the real. It substitutes it, comes in its stead. So here is the meta metaphysical problem, this logic of these formulas uh, uh, re represent that I was referring to previously. So speculation does not mediate the real. It substitutes it at least as it's understood in philosophy, in particular post-structuralist philosophy and uh, capitalism. 
So speculation does not mediate the real. It substitutes it, comes in its stead, and declares it non-existent because inaccessible to thought. Just as the bodies in Judith Butler matter as long as they're signified or they're imagined. Uh, without that, they are not. I mean, they do not exist. So in both structuralism, the real is existent in so far non-existent, only via its absence. This is explicitly so, according to, to for example, Judith Butler's epistemology. Thus, it's, uh, 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 it is uh, in so far non-existent. Only it, it is existence, uh, existent only via its absence, as such, as a body, as the instance of the real. Uh, thus, its presence, the question of whether there is such thing as the real, is relationally determined, determined by the relation of sign and signification of the subject. So it's subjectively conditioned. As Marx would say, we're looking at things from either of the two perspectives, either uh, as an object, as a, uh, from the position of a third person, as he says, or as a subject. So, or from a position of a subject. So, thus, its presence, the question of whether there is such thing as the real or matter that matters as such, is relationally determined. The problem of inaccessibility of the real as such in its fullness of presence and truth is solved in post-structuralism by its cancellation instead of an account of its mediation. Unlike the scientific uh, thought, uh, I'm comparing this to the scientific thinking in the same way in which Marx uh, uh, identifies certain flaws of uh, sort of philosophical sufficiency in uh, philosophy, uh, like the principle of self-sufficiency, and Laurel does, and this he sees as a problem um, which uh, sort of precludes the realist uh, thinking he proposes. And Laurel uh, makes a similar uh, proposal to Marx. So, now, uh, 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 so this is why I'm referring to the concept of the scientific uh, here, because in the post structuralist proposal, the core of the, the problem uh, of this um, inhibition uh, of thought is precise, uh, comes precisely from the presence and the role of philosophy there. So, unlike the scientific thought, which, uh, which subjects itself to the vicissitudes of the real in an attempt to accurately describe it, its effects, describe uh, exactly its effects, philosophy strives to discipline the real and trans transform its imperfections and meaninglessness into a truth of it. Truth that is higher and essentially a uh, philosophical form of reality originally called to on or the being. As a philosophical category, it, uh, the being compensates for the lack of perfection of the real and in particular for the lack of perfection in the physical. Structuralism knows this and in a subterfuge uh, gesture circumvents the classical philosophical naivety by declaring the attempt at mediation of the real impossible, blinded by metaphysics, proposing instead cancellation of the relevance of the real. François Larouel calls this gesture fuite en avance, an escape in advance into fiction, whereby the, the equation, the old metaphysical equation, a real equals fiction, is reversed, now fiction equals real, 
but the equation is nonetheless there, remains. So the non-Euclidean uh, twist in the approach to this question Laurel proposes consists in thoughts positioning radically unilaterally with respect to the real or non-relationally. This unilateralism, this procedure of uh, 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 unilateral difference in a way, although that's a delusion term, also called dualysis and uh, Laurel is the, the key thing in the method, but there is no much time, uh, much time to elaborate it in detail. So the impossible riddle of real's inaccessibility to thought is not to be solved. Uh, this is what uh, he proposes. Uh, the impossible riddle of the real's inaccessibility to thought is not to be solved. The real as such remains radically barred from the thinking subject. Nonetheless, so there is for foreclosure, but still that does not prevent us from thinking the effects of the real. The proposal is very similar to that of uh, uh, Meyasu's correlationism. Uh, for those who are more familiar with that idea. Uh, I am making the comparison to sort, sort of simplify uh, the argument. So, the impossible riddle, uh, uh, yeah, I read that. So, nonetheless, the real as an exteriority vis-a-vis -vis language and subjectivity, so the real in its instance of uh, in its aspect of exteriority vis-a-vis -vis language and subjectivity affects the thinking subject in the form of trauma or in the form of the arche fossil. Um, you can fi find other instantiations. Um, uh, okay, uh, let's not enter into those uh, examples, but there are really many, especially uh, if you work, uh, work with Marx. Um, so, um, trauma, archifosal, um, uh, money, for example, inflicted upon the hybrid we will call the non-human, the idea I presented at the beginning. That is, the material reality of body, machine, and the automaton of transcendence or subjectivity. So, the post-human I'm proposing here is not very different from that of Donna Haraway, but the categories are radicalized and absolutized, and by doing so, we arrive to a greater level of, of formality of the argument and getting rid of uh, the philosophical spontaneity, which sort of imports certain theological, mythological, um, uh, aut automatic presumptions, um, and the morphology of the human. So, um, even the cyborg as such, as a metaphor, sort of imports spontaneously without uh, pausing to check uh, this philosophical spontaneity, it sort of imports uh, uh, smuggles in the morphology of uh, the human, which is uh, uh, limiting the argument uh, of posthumanism, which is of benefit to us as Marxist feminists. So, but in order for this benefit to be great, uh, greater and closer to Marx, I am proposing the non-human. Uh, so, and uh, this uh, hybridity is composed of the material reality of body, machine as also something on the side of materiality, and uh, uh, I mean uh, the physical part of it. Of course, there is uh, uh, the part of it which belongs to the level of automation, and it it's there with the automaton. Uh, this is why it's important to absolutize uh, the categories for greater precision. So the material reality of the body, machine, and the automaton of transcendence inhabiting that materiality. Regarding of whether 
its origin is synthetic or organic. So, according to Lacan, the real intervenes only as a symptom of trauma, uh, manifested as an interruption in the signifying chain, an intervention of the meaninglessness uh, in the unstoppable chain of production, of here disturbing the automaton of, signi of the signifying chain. The automaton or the subject, uh, that instance uh, completely um, separated from physicality, um, but in uh, the context of you know, this philosophical foundation, I uh, thus presented. So the automaton is quite simply language in psychoanalytic or linguistic uh, sense. And in the sense of capitalist exchange system of values of market, uh, as in the patriarchal system of the exchange of women, it is no more and no less language in computing too. So the category of automaton is instantiated on all these levels. So we shouldn't get super excited about technological development if we think in these categories and uh, if we are invited to reconsider their positioning in, uh, to consider their positioning in the historical development. So, uh, and uh, uh, whereby putting uh, uh, the argument in his, uh, historical terms as well. So it is no more and lo no less language in computing too. So it's, yeah, it's more like language than intelligence, for example. Uh, the, uh, even in Turing, it's more like language in him. It, it is language in a way. So the, or it is an automaton of signification. So the question is, does cognition take place only in the form of signification? But that's a different uh, question. So. The automaton of signification is unstoppable unless intervened upon by the real defined by its exteriority vis-a-vis -vis the signifying chain. Subjectivity or the instance of transcendence is placed on the side of language or the automaton regardless of whether seen individually or collectively. So you see, it doesn't matter. If you look at the, the, the category in this way, if you look at it as a category, whether individual or collectively doesn't make any difference. So th this would be a false dualism. Uh, and it doesn't matter whether centered or decentered. The politics of input or of assigning value, assigning value, just like in that formula provided by Marx. Uh, so the politics, politics of input or of assigning value provide the modes of subjectivation of the automaton. Uh, so modes of subjectivation of the automaton. So it's a certain temporal instance and um, and an occurrence of instantiation of the automaton. It does not make any difference to the cut category as such. In the capitalocene, all ruling forms of automaton are predicated by that of capital. So, as you can notice, what I'm, I keep saying here is that this automaton of signification is the same as in contemporary philosophy. It's not very different in post-structuralist feminist philosophy. It has the same structure as uh, the automaton of capital. In a way, philosophy and capital are equated here in the argument, but there is no time to present this in detail, or, 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 although it's, it's here, it's in the paper. You will read it in the identities. Uh, there's simply no time to describe in detail how it works. So, 
in the explication of the automaton in computing to uh, compare the computer to this form of labor, we had the code, we have the code on uh, uh, the comparison between pa uh, patriarchy and uh, capital. What uh, uh, Haraway, uh, Haraway, Irigaray seems to claim though is that um, the logic of patriarchy actually underpins the logic of capital. It's kind of primordial in her. First of all, it's there in uh, the Western reason, in the constitution of Western rationality, the position of subject and object, the object as spectrality, which is uh, in cognition, holds the same position as commodity. And she identifies this uh, problem since the beginning of Greek philosophy. And she sees this as the reflection of patriarchy. Her argument seems to be that this logic of patriarchy is in fact what underpins both Western rational reason and capital. So uh, this is what she seems to say. Um, uh, okay, it's not part of the paper, it's part from an, of another paper, but uh, okay, I'll continue with uh, this one. I did not even arrive to the analysis of the subject, but anyway, Stanley Miller will say maybe more about that. So, uh, the automaton is in all these instances a different substantiation of the signifying chain. The auto production of transcendence, uh, based upon the exclusion of the physical or the material and uh, resulting into their reduction into mere resource. So the auto production of transcendence, which is also the pleasure principle, according to Lacan, Freud, uh, it is the unstoppable production of spectral existence of science, just as you know, contemporary sexuality, and in particular, heterosexuality. So it is the unstoppable production of spectral existence of science, which is only now and then reminded of the outsider uh, or, or the real by the intervention of, of Tihe, as Lacan calls it, this incidence, in a form of trauma preceding language yet affect, affecting it with anxiety. The machinic or the physical real, the support or the hardware for this hybrid new self, the non-human, or that which escapes automation is the tihe, or the incidence to the automaton of subjectivation. And it lives at its heart while being its outsideness. Regardless of whether organically or technologically physical, materiality enters the constitution of the self or for that matter, the plane of uh, technologically founded uh, reality. And this is something very nicely elaborated by Davor in his upcoming book. He will uh, speak on, uh, on the fourth day. I believe he will speak on something else, but he can mention something on the exteriority and the outsideness and the role of all of this into the the new constitution of the self in the technological era. So this self is, I argue, uh, following Laruel and Haraway, non-human or inhuman and exceeds the narrow limits of subjectivity proper. Laruel adheres to the Lacanian basic structure involving the real and the acts of signification only to su subject it to a non-Euclidean adjustment of perspective. The real and the signifying automaton constitute a diet, which is not dualism, a philosophical dualism. This is the radical diet uh, Laurel writes about, and I will briefly have, have a moment to uh, explain. So the real and the signifying automaton, so these two components that enter the constitution of the non-human, so our variation of the post-human, so the real and the signifying automaton constitute a diet which, is non, uh, which nonetheless is not a duality, 
uh, that will be dialectically reconciled through unification. The diet at, at issue, insofar as radical, is not about the paradoxical acknowledgement of the tragic truth of the unsurpassable split. Because a reference to a split as the determination in the last instance implies that there should have been an original unity. So the celebrated paradox of the constitutive split uh, uh, we find in a postmodernism, post-structuralism, but I'm intentionally saying postmodernism here, uh, is again about unity. A unity found, uh, found in embracing the impossibility of it and arriving to its truth as, as meaning uh, added to reality, creating the philosophical amphibology of real and thought that result into the concept of being or truth. So accepting paradox as reality would be accepting some truth as the real. And that's the key thing uh, and the key problem with philosophy. So. Uh, Mm, I will skip this part, it's too long, so uh, I will conclude uh, in one minute. The hybridity, uh, the hybridity of the real, substantiated as both the physical body and the physicality or materiality of the machinic which, which escapes signification or transforming it into a meaning, uh, keeps it materiality as such. And this is being affirmed, and this is why this is not a philosophical dualism that results into some kind of truth uh, that consoles us about reality. So duality as such is radicalized by way of affirming its materiality and status of the real, status of the real. Yes, that which escapes uh, the automaton. And is neither reduced nor reducible to a unification or unity insofar as philosophical truth. Such duality which relies on the unilateral non-relation, unilateral non-relation of the two components will be called the radical deed. Dialectical or any other form of conceptual unity, reconciliation of the two through successful or failed unification is about transformation of the senseless real into a truth, into a unity between the real and the truth of it, whereby the latter subsumes the former, subsumes the former, which is the founding philosophical gesture. And this is why it's uh, 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 the, the reproachment to Laurel that he is generalizing philosophy is false. He's talking about one constitutive component which is really there everywhere. So it is this founding ge gesture I just presented. And uh, it's founding paradigm, the being. And that is the amphibological substitution of the real and truth. Uh, the two are neither a pair nor one divided into two, but discrete instances of the one in interaction producing a minimal structure, similarly to the digital metaphysics of the one and its limit, rather than, as Galloway argues, of the split one. The digital uh, structure is not that of the split one into two and a pair, but rather a one and its limit, and it's none. Um, so the socialist feminist project of the cyber proposed by Donna Haraway resonated, the resonating with other materialist feminist philosophers, such as Rosie Braidotti or Shulamit Firestone, implies a diet of the non-philosophical kind. That is one which does not presuppose any unification of the two elements, yet again relying on the material continuity of the hybrid, uh, of the radical hybrid. What was initially called the cyborg gradually and uh, via the instance of bestiality in Haraway 
evolved into inhuman also in Harari. We are now talking about the post-human as uh, the inhuman, not the cyborg anymore, in Haraway's terms. Mm, I think I should stop here. It's not even the beginning, but I must stop, because the coffee will get cold. So, I, so it's the end of the lecture. And after the coffee break, you will be responding or now. I think after the coffee break, right? And, and then is the discussion as well, right? So it, uh, uh, yeah, your response could be sort of an intro and opening of the discussion. That's what I was thinking. Uh, but we can make the break short, right? If everybody's okay. So that there is time for everything. Okay then, coffee break. Thank you. Thank you.